OK. As long as everyone can hear me, is that all right? Um, it's lovely to see you all. And what a big topic. Investment, innovation, and change. There's plenty of things I could talk about, but I'm going to talk about education and wonder how our education of our, our children is going to develop over the course of the next 20 or 30 years, driven by innovation, investment, and change. Um, and I say this as a mother of an 18-month-year-old. I could have brought her here with me now as the ultimate prop, but uh, she's gone swimming with her dad, so <laughs> she's not here. But it is very interesting to see an 18-month-year-old. She loves my iPad. She intuitively knows what to do with it. The iPad was the first gadget I've ever bought without an instruction manual, and it truly doesn't need one. And how, how will she evolve and grow using digital devices as learning, as, as entertainment as well, and the two intertwined with one another? She'll be a year four primary student in 2017. Already we see schools with an array of interactive whiteboards, with um, a number of computers per classroom. Um, but what else will we see by 2017? There'll be, will there be one gadget per child, even at year four age? Will there be um, a teacher handing out and taking in results or interaction, even from primary school children, through devices in, in a more sort of interactive way? And when she's 20, um, 20, in 2025, she'll be about 16, and she'll be taking exams. We have quite a digital world already, and still our exams are taken with pen and paper, sitting at a desk, writing essays, like I did when I was um, taking my exams. And that surely will change as we go forward. She'll be graduating in around 2030, 2031, and... Already, from my perspective in Pearson, I see universities taking on, um, taking on digital devices in a really strong way. There's some universities I know of in the States that um, don't use paper or hand out iPads to students on day one. Um, and I'm sure there's examples in other parts of the world as well. But will all universities be doing that? Will our, our content be mainly on digital devices or not? Um, and there's so many different opportunities for change to build our education to be more interactive, more personal, and just be day-to-day -day part of life. And it'll be very fascinating to see it. Um, in looking at this, I think about what innovations I see around us now that will serve education going forward in the next few years. And I say this from, I sort of feel that the industry is sort of previously known as print publishing, and it's hard to give it a title that's, uh, that's the next one on. But the five trends I see now, of course, are the first is apps. I'm sure you've all spent time thinking about that today and, and in your day-to-day -day roles. Um, the one I love particularly about apps are the pass-back apps. I don't know whether you've come across these, where um, these, are, these apps for sort of one- to two-year-olds, which are designed so that when children are being a bit antsy in the back of cars, you pass your iPhone back, and there's this category emerging of pass-back apps, which I think is brilliant. And then the next, the next area or trend I think of is, is digital education and multi-platform devices that we see. Um, there's a wonderful school in Bolton, an academy called Esser Academy. It's on YouTube if you want to take a look, things there. And uh, a, a gentleman there called Abdul Chouan, who's a chemistry teacher, um, was also in charge of IT when this newest academy was set up. So he bought 1,000 iPods, and he gave them to the 900 students and the teachers, with a, together with a set of iPads. And he saw what happened. And attainment has truly gone up in that school. It's gone up to getting 99% A star to Cs in 2010, which is an achievement for any school, and they only had 67% the year before. So it's interesting to see how these devices are really raising attainment if they're used in the right way. And in this example, they use the iPad, the I, the I, the, the, um, I guess they must be the touch ones that they have. They're using them for communicating, sharing, creativity, understanding class material, looking up words you don't understand when a teacher is lecturing. All of these different areas are being used, and it's fascinating to see how this one academy has really made this work. I'm sure it's not the only example, but it is an interesting place to look. 
Another example um, would be around um, in digital education, a multi-platform would be around Results Plus, which is actually a Pearson education product. But what's interesting there is you see students logging on at 6 a.m. on Results Day to get the results online. And when I got my results, it was a case of waiting for it in the post. But it's really different now. You can log on online, get your results there and then, and you can get a much more detailed analysis of your achievement, what you did right and what you did wrong in different segments of an exam paper instead of just one overall mark. And that's tremendously helpful in terms of personalised learning and people understanding what they can, what they can good at, what they're going to achieve, and how they need to develop further. The third trend I want to just talk briefly about for an innovation in education is really about playing. I mean, no, the last speaker was talking a little bit about games there. But it's, it's fascinating when you see what can happen if you make it fun in the learning environment. There's a wonderful school in New York um, called Quest to Learn, and it's been set up by a lady called Katie Salen. And it is based all around gaming. And she is a professional games designer. And it has been set up so that each class, the curricula for each class, is delivered through a gaming, in a gaming form. And again, there's material all over the place, like on YouTube. But I think this is a real trend for us, to see how gaming and learning can be interplay with one another across the curricula across all different forms, not just the creative side of how do you develop new ways of thinking and innovative ways of looking at digital but for students to develop themselves, but also in learning the bare facts as you go along that you need to know. Um, the fourth trend is, of course, e-books. And I know this is something we all spend a lot of time thinking about. It's uh, just look at the, the degree of US trade book sales in 2010. I know you're going to talk a little bit more about this, I'm sure. Um, but it's just a, such a phenomena for us, and we see this certainly within Penguin Group and, and love it because it's another opportunity for us to get our content to consumers in a form that they want to, they want to use it. And my fifth trend is that taking it personally. How do we make sure that we, because we have the ability to do so, we really make sure that we're delivering educational in a very, very personal way? Um, it was tough to do it before when we relied solely upon textbooks, but now we have a number of different forms of delivering education and understanding student attainment as we do so. It's our duty to make it more personal than it is today, and I certainly think my daughter will experience that over the course of the next few years. If you don't mind me taking a couple more notes, is that okay? It's fine. <laughs> Checking time. Um, so we think about those trends we have now and thinking about how children and students will emerge and grow in the future, but how do we make sure we nurture innovation in our organisations? Pearson's got 37,000 employees. We're spread around the globe. I've worked now nearly seven years, and it's interesting. We think, how do we innovate? How do we make sure we get better? We are getting on with it. We had nearly 30% of our revenues last year came from digital. Um, and we're doing a lot of work in that area. And we've got some nice new products out there that I'm not going to brag about, but um, I like them every day. Um, and I think there's, it's the barriers to innovation in any organization are, 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 are high. But we, as long as we all keep the customer in mind first and think about who is the end consumer here, who's the student, who's the learner, and start with them and think about how do you make it personal, how do you make them tools for effective learning and teaching, as opposed to starting with what we have ourselves in our business. So start with the consumer and then look internally. The second big challenge, of course, is how do you free up people's time to work on innovation? Everyone's got a day job. The people with the bright ideas are also responsible for delivering end-of-year sales on something else, for example. And that's very hard. I don't have an answer for that, except for this having a culture for moving people around, for secondments, to freeing up people's time, for people being able to take over each other's responsibilities as you do so. And then the third one I notice is sometimes some people get in the way of innovation because as somebody a bright spark has the most wonderful idea, 
in a business, as it filters up through the ranks, the bright ideas, it can sometimes get um, sort of tempered somewhat. It can sometimes get diluted as to what it can be, and it loses its spark and it loses its momentum. And the ability for anyone in the organization to go to the head of business or the CEO and be able to say, here's my idea, help me with it, is very helpful indeed. And I feel we have, do have that in Pearson, and that works quite well. But I'm sure we could get better at it too. So those are just a few ideas from my perspective and thinking about education. Overall, it's all about individuals, not groups. It's about individual learning journeys and choices. We have so much data about consumers now, we're swimming in it. We never used to be. We used to rely on bookshops to sell our books and, and newsstands to sell our newspapers. But now our relationship with consumers and learners and people who buy our stuff is uh, much, much richer. And it's our duty to do something with that data. And what we do with that data is to deliver products and services which are a lot simpler, a lot more personal, and really easy, easy to use so they don't need an instruction manual. Those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. <laughs>